quick Christianity 101 lesson. Crosses and crucifixes are different things. Hopefully a lot of you know this. A cross is what we have here. It's plain and nothing is on it. But a crucifix is a cross that bears the image of Christ. And I have this tiny little crucifix in my office that stands on a, a little pedestal about that big. And I put it on my bookshelf. And it's in a position for littles to be able to come and grab it. And this is a fact I didn't think about until Julian came in my office a couple weeks ago and snatched the crucifix off of it. And he brought it up to me, and he pointed to Jesus, and he said, Papa? <laughs> and I said, no, that's Jesus. He kind of looked at it, and he said, oh, he's stuck. And he was right. It's so simple to see and understand that even a three-year-old can grasp that Jesus gets stuck on the cross. And I think being stuck is something that we understand so simply because it's about judgment. And we understand judgment. We are surrounded by it on a daily basis. Poking, sniping, evaluating, opining, judging each other. We understand the feeling of judging and of being judged. Of slinging arrows and pointing fingers and assigning blame. And it's the collective judgment all six billion of us are caught up in that stuck Jesus on the cross this Good Friday. So I had to agree with him. Yes, Julian, Jesus is stuck. And yes, Julian, you're so very right to be sad. He understood that easily enough, too, that it's sad that Jesus is stuck. And it won't be much longer until he's old enough to understand that Jesus being stuck is the heartbreaking result of our broken world. It's only a few more years until he'll see and understand how this world of violence and war and greed and sin, that humanity would choose to reject Jesus' message of love and mercy and peace. The cross of Good Friday is easy for us to understand. It makes sense when you look around at this world. Harder to understand is God's response to Good Friday, to this stuck situation. Try explaining an empty tomb to a three-year-old. It just does not make sense. It's empty, so what? The resurrection doesn't make sense to us. Not in this world. It doesn't happen. How God chooses to respond to our violence doesn't make sense to us. How do I explain to a three-year-old that the empty tomb is about judgment too? But God's judgment, and God's judgment is different than ours. You see, little ones, God judges all the time. Where we see only defeat, God judges Jesus' death, victory. Where we see only destruction, God judges that torn temple cloth as an opportunity to enter into our lives and get closer to us. Where we see only a criminal, God judges Jesus obedient. And where we see finality, God judges Jesus sacrifice, worthy of reversal. And that judgment that judgment that belongs to God, that is the stuff that brings life from death, light from darkness, order from chaos. The empty tomb is God's definitive response to our ways of sin and death. And honestly, does any of that stand a chance at being explained to a three-year-old, let alone a 43-year-old? Do you honestly, every day, get this crazy mystery that we are wrapped up in? Do we really rationally understand what resurrection means? But maybe that doesn't matter so much. Maybe resurrection isn't meant to be understood. Maybe it's meant to be lived. 
That's what I think the resurrected Jesus is trying to say to Mary Magdalene in our text today. This confused, befuddled, grieving woman who is desperately trying to understand what's going on and what is the meaning of this empty tomb. This just does not compute. Someone has got to have stolen Jesus' body, she thinks. The resurrected Lord is standing right in front of her, and she says to him, thinking he's a gardener, Was it you? Tell me what you did with his body. That someone would steal his body makes more sense to her. It is only when Jesus says her name in a way only someone who knows you in the depths of your soul can say your name that the veil of confusion is lifted and she can see Jesus standing before her. And then she does what I think a lot of us would try to do. She tries to hold on to him, to capture this moment, hang on to it. But he tells her, don't. Don't hold on to me. Don't cling to this tiny moment of understanding. Don't cling to this idea of resurrection. It's bigger than this moment. Go, he tells her. Go, tell, live. Live the resurrection. That is what this whole moment is about. It's about living the resurrection. Jesus does not want her to stay stuck in this spot, just clinging to the past of who he was as her teacher, to what she knew, to who she was. The only way Mary is truly going to understand the power of resurrection is by moving forward. And the only way to explain the resurrection to a three-year-old or anyone else is to live it. Now, what does that look like? to live the resurrection. Well, Vicar Brian has put together a really beautiful Bible study for his internship project here at Faith. And in it, he's collected Faith stories from our parishioners. And he asked if I, I'd read it, you know, just give him some thoughts. Well, you can't give me a whole Bible study on stories without me stealing all of them. It's a bad idea, Vicar. So now I've got like six new stories in my back pocket, thanks to the intern. <laughs> but in a couple weeks, you're going to get a chance to read all of these beautiful stories. It's a gift to this congregation, and we're so blessed that he has gotten to do this while he's here. But I'm going to share one of them with you now. So when her mother, Sarah, was alive, our fellow sister in Christ, Jean Claxton, would go to visit her in the health care facility where she lived. And often Jean would go during the lunch hour and sit with her mother and her mother's table mates as they ate lunch together. And they'd chat and just catch up on the day. And one of these table mates was Elizabeth. Now this was a woman who just did not speak or engage in any way. No matter how hard Jean or any of the other ladies tried to engage her, she was just absorbed in her thoughts, whatever it was that locked her away. She just sat and stared. But one day, Jean was talking about cookies with her mother. And the other ladies at the table were sharing about cookies. I mean, it sounds amazing, to be honest, just to sit and talk about cookies. And out of nowhere, Elizabeth spoke up. She said, I have a recipe for peanut butter cookies. And I could stop the story there. To me, it is just sweet enough to know that this woman for a moment broke free from her mental fog to talk about cookies. But Jean went further and continued to pull on that veil of darkness. And she asked Elizabeth for the recipe, and it was a simple one, and she actually remembered. So Jean went home, made her the cookies, and brought them back to Elizabeth. And when she bit down into one, Jean said the look on her face was priceless. I wonder if you could have called that look understanding, knowing, resurrection. Definitely a veil of darkness lifted for just a moment when she said they taste just like I remember. That, to me, is living the resurrection.
That is how you explain the resurrection to a three-year-old. You don't explain it. You live it. You pay attention to the moments you can be a part of it. We who are followers of Jesus, we respond to this great, mysterious, empty tomb good news by getting into the chaos ourselves and pulling people from darkness to light. A lot can happen in three days. Among those possibilities is the radical notion that we could learn how to get unstuck from sin and death and shame by living resurrected lives. For the resurrected Christ lives in such moments. He lives, he lives, he lives in and through our resurrected lives. Thanks be to God for Jesus and for Easter. Amen.